you've landed Inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Hey, Launch Streeters. What's up? It's Tamara here, your host and, you know, lover of all things innovation. It's January 2019. So do you want to know what it's like to push the boundaries of an industry, to do what others are afraid to do, and to see the payoff of a willingness to change and innovate? Ah, me too. That's why I had Brian Benstock of Paragon Honda on Inside Launch Street. I know, it sounds a little weird, right? This is a guy who owns a car dealership. Yes, he's in the auto sales business, which, by the way, hasn't changed in longer than I can remember. We talk about this on the podcast. The auto industry overall is changing. Tech, you know, Technology, automation, AI, cars, all of that's changing. But think about the dealership model, going to the dealership, getting your car, all of that stuff. That hasn't changed in so long. But he recognizes the need to change with the customers as they change. And because of that, they are flocking to him. And now the competitors are trying to catch up. You will be shocked at some of the things that he was willing to do and change from a business model, from a marketing, from a sales perspective in that industry. This is a great lesson in what's possible, even in legacy industries, which I know a lot of us are in. All right, let's get to it. Brian, I'm so excited to have you today. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. So glad to be here. Well, since this is our first time getting together, what's the one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? Uh, I think that I'm a competitive runner. I didn't start running until I was 46 years old, but I've run uh, 24 marathons since then. Oh, my gosh. I started running in honor of my my boss who was suffering from lung cancer and wanted to run. And um, since he wasn't able to do it, I said, I'll do it for you. And everyone said, you don't run. And I said, I'll figure it out. And I did. (laughs) So I have to ask, what, what is it about running that you like so much that you would keep doing it? It's the best drug anybody could ever do. There's a, you know, whenever I'm um, uh, not in a great mood, my wife says, put your sneakers on and go out and run. There's, there are endorphins that you're never going to know that you've got until you get to a certain part. There's an, that runner's high. Yeah. And, and, and it also, I, th- I think it's very analogous to business, right? You, you've got to m- manage uh, a limited resources over a protracted period of time. You know, you can't go out there full blast. And, you know, so, so as I started seeing running as a managing a business, it became really helpful to my, my uh, business. You know, what's interesting about the runner's high. I'll just share this with you really quickly before we kind of dig into the business side. I, I love running. My challenge with it for me is that my runner's high or my, whatever that mojo is, kicks in at about mile six or seven. Well, so short runs are so painful for me. I, I can second that. That's exactly what happens. And I think, I think that's the price you've got to pay to get the high. Mm, you know? and, right. And so, that's so the effort. Yeah, it's a good thing because you, you, you don't want the high to be so easy. You, you've got to actually do something to earn that high. But you're right. I, I settle in uh, at about mile four. You do, and, yeah. Anybody, anytime someone asks me to do a 5K, I'm like, mm, can we make it a 10K? At least then I'll get my high <laughs> at some point. <laughs> exactly right. So let, let's dig in because you're right, actually. I'd say that what we were just talking about, that effort and that payoff is really quite analogous to business. Um, and let me just back up. I want, I want to dig into your industry a little bit, but, but tell us a little bit about you so that our listeners have context for where you're coming from first. Well, I, um, I'm an automobile salesperson uh, that uh, started out in 1982 selling cars. I say I'm an automobile salesperson because my wife, whenever we're at a party and people ask what I do, I say I sell Hondas. And, and she, you know, I, maybe she's embarrassed. And she jumps in there and says, no, 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 no. He's the general manager, vice president. Of the and I said, listen, I sell Hondas. <laughs> and, and I've been sort of on this 30-year journey of uh, making uh, – uh, s- uh, selling uh, – Automobiles easier for customers, and more recently, uh, I guess the past 10, 15 years, I've become known as a, a sort of a disruptor, 
And uh, I used to believe in doing, you know, uh, personality based and now I'm process based and uh, and technology based. And, and so I used to be uh, a salesperson that uh, occasionally used technology. Now I feel like I'm a technology guy uh, that sells automobiles. Mm. So I want to dig into this industry. And, I, and it's I, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because you have such a longevity in the industry. And like you said, you have become known as a disruptor with some of the things that you're doing that we'll talk about. But, you know, when you think about automobiles, particularly dealerships, I mean, you you really work in an industry that's dealing with massive change. And I think at the same time, has some legacy thinking that's holding it back. So how do you approach that, that combination? And probably what I should say is clash of change and legacy. Well, well first of all, you're spot on. There, there is a massive change disruption going on in the automobile business. And it's our own fault. We've had franchise laws that have protected us for years um, and have really uh, uh, slowed innovation that's taken place in many other industries. And let me give you an example of that. If you wanted to buy a car uh, you, and you were going to buy it from me, if you didn't like what you the experience, you could go to somebody else and buy it from them. But the experience is really a variation of the same thing. There was no way to go outside of the franchise system to purchase a car. And, and this has been the way it has been for many years. And I think there are very valid reasons to having franchise laws, and I support them. But it's also retarded the change necessary. So as other industries were adapting and changing, our industry didn't have to. And customer expectations are not based on the last time they bought a car and this time. Right. Customer expectations are based on different ways that they interact in the regular world, right? And, and so, so as the regular world has made it easy to uh, consume uh, different things like uh, uh, Amazon and, 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 and Google and Uber and some of these other uh, – and, and Apple – uh, as, as, as they've made it easy for consumers to do business, the automobile business has not needed to change or thought it didn't need to change. But what did change is the customer's expectation. And what was once acceptable, the three-hour delivery process, a four-hour delivery process, is no longer acceptable. And I think that's a great thing. Yeah. And so here's my question for you on that. Um, and that's so interesting the way you map that out. When you thought about this and the changes that you wanted to make, was your mindset, I'm going to change the rules, the laws, the way the system is done? Or was your mindset, I'm going to find the loopholes where I can change along with the customers? Because I, I think what you're saying there is 100% not only right, but important, which is the industry didn't change, but the customers did. You better believe it. And everything else in the customers' lives. Too. Yeah. So we got to, we've got to give credit to Elon Musk, right? He pierced the protective umbrella that's been protecting the dealers with the French with respect to the franchise law by using electrification as a, a way to do that. Now, many of my dealer brothers and sisters may not say we have to thank him, but it, it's going to force change. Yeah. And it's going to force us to grow. And, and, and by the way, we'll outmanufacture him. We'll outsell him. We'll outsmart him. Uh, but only when we realize we need to change. And in the past, they've stopped the brilliant people like him. Think of Tucker back in the day. They, they stopped these innovators. Uh, and today you can't stop. You can't stop them. So we might as well adapt and, and get out there ahead of them. Well, I think what you're saying in there about you know, change is being forced on you now is such a great thing to recognize to go, okay, and which place do you really want to be in? Do you want to be part of creating the change or at least accepting it and adapting? Or do you want to be that one that's fighting it until you have no choice? Because at that point, aren't you really behind? Tamara, I think most dealers live in a world that no longer exists and they're holding a world that no longer exists. Customers will not accept the way that we're doing business. And if they can do it without us, they will. Take a look at what happened with Uber and the disruption of Uber. Yeah. Now, it's easy to see how that impacted the taxi uh, and limousine commission and other people that take taxi cabs. But what, what people didn't realize is the impact it would have on automobile sales. And, and, and right. more, more especially in a city like New York. In New York City, if you drive less than 11,000 miles a year, it's less expensive to have an Uber than it is to own or lease a car. Which is most people in the city. You better believe it. And, and if, I mean, and, and, and when you own a car or you lease a car in New York City, you have three payments. You have the monthly payment on the car, you've got the parking payment, uh, and, and you've got the insurance payment. And, and again, if you're a real New Yorker, you also have that fourth uh, payment, which is the monthly ticket payment. Right, that's right. That was my payment when I lived there. <laughs> yeah, and it's going to happen to you. You're going to get at least one a month and maybe, maybe more. Uh, and and you, what you don't have, if you have a car, you don't have the convenience. Because with Uber, it'll pull you up to right where you're going, drop you off there, 
And, and I think there's a real education in the Uber process, right? Um, Uber has given the consumer shared control of the process. And this learning uh, has taught me what we need to do at the dealership. And let, let's talk about that shared control of the process. You can pick the car you want. You can pick the driver you want based on their reviews. You could pick uh, certainly the destination of pickup, certainly the destination of delivery. Uh, and and so, so it gives the consumer the choice. You can also pick the price point. Right. You know, there are some that uh, – feel it's important to, to drive there in an SUV. There are others that will take a Prius uh, and there's everything in between. So, you know, I, I think it really lets the customers have it their way. And I think that's very important. And it's a very important learning and understanding that we as dealers can adapt uh, to and, and, and bring into the sales processes that we have within our organization. It's, you know, it's, I want launch shooters out there to just take a second and really think about that shared control concept, shared control of the process that Brian here is talking about, because I think that's the thing that's going to disrupt a lot of other industries. So if we look at healthcare, cable, a, a lot of them, I, I think that's the thing that's going to take a lot of the big guys down or force them to change drastically very soon. Yeah, the longer you hold on to this past, I think the, the quicker it is that you're going to um, exit the business that you're in. And look at Netflix, right? The yeah. notion of me having to be at home uh, at 8 o'clock on and, and Sunday evening to watch a particular television show is right. ridiculous. It's, and it's I over. Can, <laughs> I can watch the show when I want, how I want, whenever I want. I can watch it on multiple devices. I can watch it on a laptop. You know, So, so I, I'm now taking this as people aren't consuming less transportation. They're consuming it differently. And if we're going to hold on to the past, we're going to miss the biggest opportunity. As consumers consume this transportation differently, is it possible for us to be there however they're consuming the transportation? I don't care how they consume it as long as they use me to consume it. So if they want to do it fractionally, that's okay. Subscription, that's okay. If they want to do a leasing, that's okay. If they want to own it, that's okay. I have no preference to how they consume our transportation. Isn't it funny, don't you think, that sometimes we double down on how we've always done it and we try to force the consumer, the customer, to do it our way? I'll just share with you very quickly. I did some work for a newspaper. This was a while back now when really the kind of everything was moving online. And this newspaper, and, there were, and not actually, let me rephrase that. It was after everybody moved online, but when all the bloggers and just, and Huffington Post came on the scene and all these other kind of where the consumer and the, and the public was actually contributing the content to. And I'll never forget being in their, one of their conference rooms and them saying, no, they people just don't get it. We just have to prove to them why getting the newspaper every week is a value to them. Like the people who are smart get it. We just have to share that message more. And I just remember just falling out of my chair thinking, oh my gosh, you are you are having the wrong conversation. A dinosaur, right? Yeah. So, and I can use a newspaper example also. You stole my thunder. We had <laughs> A, a local New York newspaper we used to spend $100,000 a month with. And we were going to renew our contract. And we said, That's we'll make for this, advertising. Yeah, for advertising. We, we said, we're going to make the same uh, commitment going forward. And they were demanding a, a 5% increase. And, and, and you know, I, I, so for whatever reason, I, uh, uh, financial reason, I dug in and said, no, it's this way or it's nothing. And they said, fine, it's nothing. And we, we took what we would have spent – uh, on print advertising, we, we invested it in digital, but we were, we weren't completely sold on digital. And this is a long time ago. So we, we took only 35,000 and put it into digital and the results were two X what wow. we were getting in the newspaper. So then of course they called us back a week later and said, okay, we'll do the hundred thousand. And I said, no, and no said, okay, we'll, we'll do 60. No, no, thanks. And we really have not advertised in that paper ever since. So, so, uh, but, but dealers, again, they hold on to what they know. And speaking of newspaper advertising, dealers, when digital first came out, would take their newspaper ad, uh, copy it and put it online. Yeah. That's not a digital ad. I know. <laughs> And it's just not, I mean, every medium has its own language, right? Its own culture. And that just wasn't, it was just ridiculous. I mean, it, it's funny to see some of the things we used to do in that in that transition and people kind of holding on. But, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about what you're saying is when you look at your business, you're really looking outside the dealership world and even the auto world for that inspiration and, and those ideas and to understand how the customer really lives. And I think that's one of the things that often in business that, that we miss is we get so myopic, we don't look wide enough. And one one of the things that I saw that you said that I wanted to ask you about, about is you wanted to be the Apple store for Honda. 
Yeah. What did you mean by that? Well, we, we look at the Gang of Four, you know, and uh, Scott Galloway, uh, Professor Galloway calls them the Gang of Four, Google, uh, uh, Google Facebook, uh, Apple, uh, and Amazon. And, and each of these major players is approaching a trillion dollars. In, yeah, it's in crazy. So, so, and what do they have in common? They, they, they spread out big bases, you know, the large, uh, what they call the LCD or lowest common denominator. And they, they, they focus on getting users and, and then monetizing u- uh, users. So we, we, when we looked at the Apple store, the Apple experience, Apple doesn't care if you buy it online or in the store. And we thought, well, that, that's really interesting. What if we took a look at that for ourselves? And, and what if we developed an online platform that was that was great and we developed an in-store platform that was great and they looked and felt the same, but they were different. And, and again, so we don't have to care. We don't have to have a preference. Does Apple care whether or not I buy a set of headphones in the store or online? I don't think they do. No, they don't and, care and they make both experiences phenomenal. And, and somehow they make both experiences are similar, right? Yeah. I mean, we call it the click is like the brick. You know, whether you, whether you buy it online or you buy it in the store, somehow they're different, but they're, but they're similar. So we set out to do that with a store without walls. And, and it was amazing how the providers in the automobile industry were hesitant to be able to create what I wanted, which, which was I want a button that says buy it now. Uh, and I had several presentations and none, and these are multi-million dollar corporations. They flew in from all over to show me their online platform, and there was no buy it now button. And you know why? Because they, they know that, that dealers aren't ready for that. So, and, they, and what they're trying to do is build it to scale. I don't mm. want something that's built to scale. Right. You can't scale Michael Jordan. I want something that's unique. I want something that's not, not above everybody else. I want something that's not scalable. I want something that's incredible that blows our customers' minds. So I'm assuming then people are buying online with this buy button. Yeah, they, they are. You know, they are. And, and, and you know, the studies show, uh, Google North America studies show 49% of the people are willing to buy online uh, and, and forego the dealership experience. 53% of the people will actually consider buying a car that they ne- that was never uh, a brand new car like a Tesla or an Apple car or a Polar Star. These are uh, uh, companies that were never around before because they, they want to get out of the process that they've been uh, experiencing. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was at the mall the other day, which I try very hard to avoid, but I had to go to the Apple store. So it's a good experience. But other than that, I try to avoid it. But I stopped at the Peloton store, the those indoor bikes, because yeah. it was packed. And I wanted to see what all the deal was. And I asked the guy, the sales guy, I said, do you sell a lot here? He said, no, no, no. People just come in for the experience. They buy it online. Yeah. I was like, God, they're buying like, exp- this is like thousands of dollars in equipment. Yeah. But so, so again, I'm, I'm a gym owner. Uh, I, and one of the first things I did with the gym was I put Peloton bikes in. And a Peloton at home. And, and again, what did we talk about before? Shared control of the process. Have you ever tried to uh, leave your office to get to a Soul Cycle class? I have. And sometimes the four mile trip from Paragon to Soul Cycle on 63rd trip, the four mile trip can take 20 minutes, 40 minutes, or an hour. And so you, you book the class and you get there just beforehand, and sorry, you're too late and you miss the class. Or the only class that's available is this one woman's class. That, oh my God, she's terrible. And, and, and so I won't mention her name. Uh, but, but, but what I can do with the Peloton is I can pick the time, I can pick the date. Yeah. I, I can pick the time, I can pick the effort, I can pick the length of the class, I can pick the instructor, I can pick the music. So there's a, a cat there. Jen, Jen Jacobs, she's fantastic. And I can pick the, the 30 minute or 45 minute or an hour class, depending on you know where I am in my training schedule. And I can do it whenever I want to do it. I, I can't miss a class in my basement. It's whenever I yeah, want. Yeah, it, it, it's, you're right. That whole shared control is fascinating. And, you know, so you've done some transformative things at your, at your Honda dealership. Tell us about them and, and, I, and specifically why you did them. Well, okay, so so uh, uh, it's a great uh, learning experience for me. I, somebody sent me this box, and in the box was a, an Amazon Alexa. And I, I took it out and I looked at it, and my, my assistant and I hooked it up, and it's got this nice little blue light at the top. And I'm a coffee fiend. You know, that's, I have a couple of vices, and coffee's one of them. And so I said, well, let, let, let that be the first thing I order. And I looked at it and said, hey, Alexa, uh, order a Starbucks K-Cup coffee. And I said, okay, Starbucks K-Cup cup coffee 40 pack it's you know she's talking now yeah (laughs) she talks randomly 
It's $11. Oh, because you said Alexa orders Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, so I think I just bought some coffee. Oh, my God, so, that's funny. Great, right? But so so I, I, I commanded it to... I, I commanded to buy the coffee and it asked me my password and I gave it my password and um, it said, okay, thank you. The next thing I know, the ne- I forgot about it. The next thing I know, the next day, a box of Starbucks coffee shows up and I go, oh my God. So I, I call somebody else and, and I do the same thing. And they, were, they weren't as impressed as I was, but I said, no, do you understand what I just did? Do you Stan, I, I ordered coffee. I didn't swipe. I didn't touch. I didn't open up an application. I used simply voice. I go, this is unbelievable. And, and anybody that knows me that was working here at the dealership at the time knows I had about 40 boxes of coffee in my office a couple of days later. I kept bringing people in to redo that experience. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and to, to not, not that I'm a dummy. I wanted to learn. I take a page out of the book. You know, the great thing about the Internet is it's really easy to learn because everything people do is online. And I wanted to see where was Amazon sor- sourcing this coffee. And, and I realized something else. They don't care where they source, source the coffee. They care that their customer gets served. And I think dealers uh, better understand this, that the consumer doesn't care where they get the product so long as they get the product. And I think the person that makes it frictionless, the, the most frictionless wins. And so, so I, I, I started and I, I coined a term, the future is frictionless. And I believe that the future is frictionless. Yeah. And, and, and so that, so th- then I said, Hey, how do we do this, uh, in, in car sales? How do we, how do we sell a car without friction? And we, we, we had to start by realizing where are the pain points. And I went to the people at Google and I said, Hey Google, I need your help. I want to, I, I want to sell cars online. I want to use voice technology to do it. Can you help? And, you know, to, to take a, a process that took two and a half years to bring it down to a minute or so, uh, they, they said, yes, but you have to start out with um, uh, service. I said, no, but I want to start, I want to sell cars. And there's this wonderful woman at Google named Joanne. And Joanne put me in my place and she said, no, Brian, we're going to start out with service first. We're going to build a big base first. And then once you have the service base built, then you can move to test drives and purchasing online. And, and um, I realize now and only now how correct she was. So, so now we have, uh, we realize that one of the major pain points for customers calling a dealership was service. It took yeah. eight for people to get through. And they made the appointments. The appointments were never convenient for the customers. So we decided to take all of that out. And here's what we did. We developed voice technology where you could say to Google, hey, Google, talk to Paragon Honda. And we'll talk to Paragon Honda. And you can schedule a service appointment. It takes about a minute and a half to schedule. Once you schedule it, it will send you a text confirming the appointment. It'll put it on your Google calendar and it'll load the appointment in the store. Wait, there's more. The other pain point, the other pain point was, do you want to sit in my service department and drink my coffee? No, Ever? no offense, no. but it's also probably not very good coffee. Or maybe it is because you have so much of it. <laughs> but right, and, but, and, and, and even if the coffee is good coffee, you don't want you don't want to sit there. Uh, you don't want to watch no. what was on and it's it's never what you want to be on the television. And, and so what we do, we, we tie the voice command into uh, a service that picks up your car at your house. We'll service the car when you're not using it and put it back in your driveway. And we don't charge. It's fantastic. So, so, so we, we thought the pain points are getting to the dealership. We thought the pain points are the time. And, and then we realized something. 96% of the time, your car is sitting. And so why don't we why don't we make better use of that time the majority of the time when you're not using the car and do the service and and, and I was I was talking with a, a colleague before uh, 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 about imagine if you could do your dental work while you're sleeping imagine if you could take a, take uh, slide your teeth out put them in a drawer send them over to the dentist while you yeah. sleep you wake up and Great. your teeth are back they're clean and it, there's no cavities in them and there's no pain well wouldn't we all sign up for that or right? I know yeah. I would. Uh, so, so how do you take that friction out of doing business with customers? And Tamara, the, the results are nothing short of spectacular. We, we, we uh, started out in uh, 2017, and in August of 2017, we picked up 600 customers' cars, serviced them, and brought them back to the customer. One year later, that number had gone up 300% wow. to, to 1,900 uh, cars picked up in the month of August and delivered back to customers. But even more uh, important than that is the consumers are actually opting to spend more with us yeah. than when they're in the store. Well, that was going to be my next question, which I think you answered, which is did that impact sales, right? Yeah. Because it is a part of what you're buying. Yeah, it, it sure is. But it, it's, but the, the, the customers actually, the, the transaction 
uh, itself, the service transaction, the, the value of that transaction doubled because the customers are more likely to, okay, while you're there, do the brakes, do the yeah. tires. Uh, but, but, but if you're waiting in the lobby, staring at your watch, drinking the bad coffee, watching the, you know, Jerry Springer on television, you want to get the heck out of there. So if I suggest additional work, even if you need it, you say, you know what, I'll do it later. And then you end up not doing it. Yeah, it's, I love that you did that. I'm curious. I get from the customer perspective why we would be so thrilled about it. What kind of response or feedback did you get from other dealer owners, other people in the industry? I mean, were they kind of freaked out by what you did? Did they follow suit? In the industry? Yeah. Uh, well, I, it's not so easy to develop your own voice technology code that ties in uh, and yeah. interface with all of this. So not not yet. Uh, is the answer. There's a lot of inquiries, and I think we're, we're going to see a lot of people going. I, I, I'm proud that yeah. we're in the world to build this with Google. And Google wrote a really nice article, I think, with Google slash Paragon uh, about the the journey. But this will really tie in nicely for what's next, which is buying it online. Yeah. Let, let's think of it this way. Uh, when you're driving in your car, imagine a world where you can ask your car anything. And, you know, and, and that world is here now. And Google Assistant being inside the car and you say, hey, Google, uh, uh, how, how many uh, seconds in a day? And you'll get the answer. Whatever the question is, people used to look to God and they still do, thankfully, for answers. But now you can look to Google for simple answers uh, and, and get that without taking your hands off the steering wheel. I'm reminded of I'm going off on a tangent, but it comes back to all this. Um, my cable recently went out. I don't actually have – I stream everything. I don't actually have um, stations. I just have it for the internet. And um, my they actually accidentally cut my cord and then couldn't come for a week to service my house to get my internet back up and running for a week. And then, of course, I got my two- to three-hour time frame, which they came at the very end of it, of course. And I, in that moment, thought to myself – can I go without internet? Can I just, you know, I can just hook into my phone subscription, actually, my wire. Like, why am I paying this? The the amount of friction that's caused by not not putting yourself into the customer's lives like you did is massive. And I think that some companies don't recognize that that, that really isn't just a, a, a frustration that we're willing to put up with anymore. It's a reason for us to leave. Well, I, I've heard rumors that they're going to add that to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> It's a Wi-Fi interface. <laughs> right, that's right. You know, I mean, it was, it was shelter, nutrition, companionship, and a hot, hot spot. Well, have you ever uh, been on an airplane when they don't have Wi-Fi nowadays and you're like, what the hell? My Lord. You know, I can remember complaining about the connection. And the person next to me said, hey, you're traveling at 500 miles an hour at 30,000 feet. <laughs> Give a break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the technology, the technology is, that, that serves is the technology – that, that I like, uh, usable technology. And, and technology, you know, uh, in the dealership now is helping us to identify what what services the customers need at what time so we can better serve those customers. Think of it this way. There's, there's absolute data that would say when you change your brakes, the front brakes on a car, let's say a 2016 Honda Accord, when you change your front brakes, there's a period uh, uh, when the brake, rear brakes need to be changed. And let's say 11 months. Imagine if we could serve the customer a message in nine months saying, you're going to need brakes. Would you like us to pick up your car and service the rear brakes and put it back in your driveway? You're more likely to, to, to require or request that service if we make it easy for you. And it's good for the customer. And it's certainly good for the business. You know, the old saying, what you know in advance, prepare for in advance. So when you know you're going to need rear brakes, well, why not just make it easy for people to do whatever it is that they need to do? Well, and I will say this just pers on a personal note. I mean, I don't know anything about my car except for the fact that I drive it and I need to do the oil every you know certain thousand miles. So the fact that there's stuff that needs to happen with the brakes or the engine or anything else, frankly, I don't even know what struts are, but I've heard the word. So if someone could just tell me what I need to do when, it would be so wonderful because I'm not an expert in my car. I just drive it. Right. And, and, you know, sometimes by the time those lights come on, that light yeah. is to say it, it's a problem. Right. And, and, and I think, again, we can anticipate the customer's needs and, and meet those needs. And the more we, we do that, the, the, the more we're going to see. A lot of dealers are afraid of going online because they think they can't make revenue. And, and, I, and I, think it, I think of Kodak when I hear that story. You know, the, Kodak had the first 
patents on digital technology. I know, crazy, right? And, and but they, they they were hanging on to the business that they were in, yeah. which was the film business yeah. and the paper and printing business. And can you imagine by making it easy, which is what digital has done, more photographs are taken digitally in a single day than were taken in the entire history of film photography. So today, more more pictures will be taken today than were taken in a hundred years with cameras. Why? A, the distribution of cameras. We've got them in our hand, in our pocket, in the form of smartphones. B, the ease. You don't have to go to the drop, drop off the film, um, uh, then go back and pick it up, roll the 35 millimeter film in the camera. And, and, and so, so we've made it easy. In, it, in addition to that, the pictures, we can share the joy. I can take a picture of my, my, my daughter and send it to her grandmother in England or her other grandmother on the West Coast simply by you know, clicking and sending it. So, so I, I think that's very analogous to what we're doing in the car business. I think that we will see more transactions cons- uh, uh, conducted by more customers, the easier we make it for people to do business. Why do you think there's so much friction in business? Is it just a matter of change hasn't kept, we haven't kept up with the change that our customers are facing or is there something else going on? Well, there's something else going on. I think, I think a lot of times uh, in, in sales, we think there's an advantage to having somebody sitting in front of you for process of selling. I, I, I'm going to use potentially manipulating, but it's just not true. Look at Amazon. What's the difference between you know, a- Amazon and, and Google? And, and what has Amazon figured out? I, I ask this question often, what's the number one search engine? And the answer I most often get is Google. And I said, oh, okay, uh, let me change the question a little bit. What's the number one search engine for retail? Yeah, well, Amazon. Say, um, and, and, and in fact, Amazon's growing at 1,900% over the last 10, 10 years where regular uh, businesses are, are, are seeing double-digit uh, declines. And why is that? I think Google, through search, brings a customer to the product. Right? You search, you put a word in, and, 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 and Google gives you the choices of where you can go. Amazon, through search, brings the product to the consumer. So I will just admit this because it's kind of funny, but totally lies into what you're saying. Last night I was at the um, at a st- big department store trying on holiday party dresses. And I found this dress that I absolutely loved, but it's one size too big. And I could get away with it. I don't know that anyone would notice given the style, but I wanted my size. So I was in the dressing room. I tried it on and I'm sitting there and I think to myself, and again, I'm only at the mall because I had to be. I was at the Apple store. So this is what happens to me when I end up at the mall. Like, thank God for the Apple store. Otherwise, malls would be over. But um, I'm in the dressing room and I, instead of going out and asking someone if they have a smaller size, if they can help me, I just went on to Amazon and found yeah. it in my size and bought it while I was in the dressing room of the department store. <laughs> and, and it'll be at your house the next day. And, right. and, and, and if you really wanted to be there that day, hey, let's just make it easy for people to do business. There yeah. will always be a need for a, a, a retail outlet, uh, just not as many of them. As efficiencies improve, there'll be uh, a need for less and less dealerships. And you know, I, I think the dealer of the future is the dealer that's preparing for that now. They're saying, "Hey, uh, well, this contraction is going to happen. It's it's been happening for many years. It's going to continue. In fact, it's going to accelerate." It used to be in 1950 there were 45,000 dealers. Oh wow! And now there are 17,000. Oh. Yet we're selling more cars. Why? Oh, because, interesting. Because efficiencies. Yeah. And that's continue. Do you think that the dealership itself will go away or that it'll become the, the need or, or what you want out of it becomes different and becomes more of a, for lack of a better way to say it, a pop-up shop? It becomes a boutique, right? Yeah. And, and who's leading the way there? Uh, Mr. Elon Musk. Yeah. And then the franchise laws, again, uh, don't allow that for dealers currently. Mm. So, you know, you, you've got to sell them. You've got to service them where you sell them. You've got to have certain requirements. Oh, interesting. Uh, of, of, of buildings, right? To tell a, a main franchise that you want to build a, a two car uh, showroom someplace. They, they, they have these incredible requirements. Uh, I, I looked at plans for a dealership a friend of mine was building, 100,000 square feet. It's a $40,000 plus, a $40 million project. And my gosh, do you need that? I don't think so. I think I could sell a similar number of cars with you know, a, a, a storefront and online. So, yeah. That, that, that's the direction I think we're going to see uh, dealerships go to. And keep in mind, Amazon, uh, after closing a good number of bookstores, is now opening up bookstores. I know. And they're, yeah. and they're, using, their, they're using their incredible database to stock the bookstore with the most popular books that people are buying. No yeah. waste 
or space. So, so do I see a, a, a day when we can do that with automobiles? Absolutely. Right? Do I, when do I see that day? Now. You know, it, you can use the data that you have to know exactly what cars to store and, and, and save the, uh, uh, the interest charge on the millions of dollars of uh, inventory that we're uh, forced to keep. That's incredible. And I have to imagine, and I'd love to get your perspective on this, that, that has a kind of like Uber overall has a ripple. I mean, Uber's having an effect on healthcare too with the Uber Health. I mean, there's a lot going on like that Uber's actually impacted, but with what you're, all these changes that you think are coming, I have to imagine has an impact not just on dealerships, but then on the GMs and the Fords and then kind of trickling out from there. Well, yeah, it, it, the manufacturers are going to have to change what they're doing and how they're doing it and, uh, and who they're distributing uh, transportation to. You know, it, but perhaps they have a hub someplace like an Amazon warehouse where they keep the inventory and they don't make the dealers carry that inventory on their back. Maybe perhaps they have uh, just in time delivery. So when a customer orders it, it gets shipped from the hub directly to the customer. The dealer gets paid uh, and we can share the cost of storage. And that, that would take the, the burden of the real estate off of the dealers and put it someplace else and maybe we could have economies of scale by doing that. You know, so that there are a lot of great opportunities, but the dealers and the manufacturers have to start thinking as one, right? There's not the Apple store. Uh, they don't compete with one another, but you know, sometimes the dealerships find themselves in an adversarial relationship with the franchise, the fr- franchise or, uh, you know, the manufacturers. And, and it can't be. The consumer, when they buy a car from our dealership, think that they're dealing with Honda. And that experience needs to be consistent throughout the process. And it's going to be consistently good. Yeah. What's kind of blowing my mind is the kind of how at odds the rules and the regulations are relative to where the marketplace is not just headed, but is already gone. And it may, and I hope launch readers out there actually are thinking like I am about what are the rules and, and not, not necessarily like as big laws and regulations as you have, but even just the rules that we have in our business that are actually at odds because this is how we do things, you know, with where really our marketplaces have gone. Well, again, you you have to um, build this for where things are going, not for yeah. where they. And and so you know, voice technology, I think, is a, is something um, that why would you ever um, type or search for the weather when I can just say, hey Google, what's the weather in New York City? Right. And, and you get the answer, you know. And, and it's just you do it friction without friction, or you can play whatever music you want to play uh, just by asking for that music to play. You know, it's just uh, an incredible opportunity for us. And that's going to cause the advertisers really to, to struggle. So, so if I said, hey, Google, what's the weather in New York City? Currently in New York City, it's 39, <laughs> mostly sunny. So, so there's a real... Today, it'll be partly cloudy with a forecasted high of 41 and a low of 34. Now, that's, that seems like a simple transaction, but it's really the implications of that are unbelievable, right? Think yeah. of if think if you if you were going to do a search on your laptop or on your phone and you were going to search for weather and think of all the different choices that would come up right you would have the weather channel you'd have the local weather and and then how did those choices get there well somebody paid to be there now what happens when search is voice how do you get yourself to be to come up when i when i make that request how do you uh if i said search for the best suv how do you get your brand to come up. So there's a whole nother opportunity. And so it's almost like in the pre-internet days, 1994, five, six, and, and, and AdWords, those of us that understand where this is going can start to develop those processes and those AdWords now in the early stages to really dominate. And, I, and I'm, I'm looking forward to um, being a part of that uh, understanding. Well, I want to have this conversation again with you in, in like two years and see what <laughs> you've done and where you think it's headed next. And one of the things yeah. I wanted to ask you kind of before we run out of time is, you know, you had mentioned this whole frictionless future. I think that's huge. And anyone not talking about kind of those friction points in their business, I think is going to find it very painful and competitors taking their customers. What are some of the other big things that you're seeing that we need to be paying attention to? Because I think it's helpful to understand and kind of what, what are those big trends and patterns that I think that helps you innovate to know what matters? You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm kind of the talking in circles, but. Well, uh, voice technology is, I, I, I think if we're going to talk, let's start with the biggest changes that are coming. Yeah. Uh, Amazon uh, through its Alexa uh, portal and, and uh, Google through its Google devices uh, are now laying the pipework, the infrastructure to make everything voice controlled. So you're going to 
to your car and you're going to talk to the car. And, you know, a picture of this, you t- tell your car to make you a cup of coffee and a cup of coffee comes out of the dashboard. That's here already. Uh, you, you, but, 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 but then the next part of that is going to be the car is autonomous. So I, so, so I, I, I have the control and I tell my car, uh, take the kids to school. And my autonomous car takes the kids to school, giving me a video copy of the entire transaction, letting me know that they're there. I state and time stamped and they come back. Uh, I, it's going to dramatically impact um, where we live, where we park, how we park. Why would I store a car in the city where it's really expensive? I can have the car drop me off and go back. Mm-hmm. It's going to impact manufacturers. Manufacturers in the automobile business may be selling cars directly to Uber and Lyft. I mean, what's the most expensive part of the Uber sales process, the driver. Yeah. And the drivers, you know, God bless them, are asking for higher wages. But it's those very higher wages that are going to accelerate their elimination because because it becomes more cost effective to have a, a, a car with no driver. Well, I just love, you know, Uber, Airbnb, all of these um, you had mentioned in the beginning that, you know, your car is sitting dormant, what, 90% of the time or whatever the number was. But, yeah. you know, all of these businesses that have popped up around using your stuff when you're not. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. And so yeah, we, I always ask that question. How many beds does Airbnb own? None. Yeah. Uh, how many cars does Uber own? None. Uh, but, but yet they're the largest producers of, uh, of uh, overnight stay and or transportation. Uh, I have a dry cleaner. The dry cleaner is in my town. I have never been there. They pick up the dry yeah. cleaning from my garage and they drop off the suits twice a week. I, I don't know what they're charging me. It doesn't matter so long as they don't mess up and they haven't messed up. And when I say it doesn't matter, whatever we agreed to day one is what they're still right, charging. Right, you're not checking every time. I'm not checking. I mean, yeah. and, and so where they're located is irrelevant. If it was Seattle, I don't care. I'm in New York. I, I don't care. <laughs> so, so long as it's there on time and it is like clockwork. So I, I think this notion of being anchored to a store or, or a place, uh, we've got to give up that. And the notion of ownership is changing. People are not consuming less transportation. They're just consuming it differently. And that's my key takeaway. Look at Bird, right? The company Bird that's using making these scooters. Yeah. Uh, now, and, and that's exploding all over cities. People, you just rent a you rent a ride. That's the ultimate fractional uh, ride share. I'm going to take a scooter from one part of the town to the other and drop it off. You know, my um, my son goes to middle school and it's about a mile and a half down the street from us. He usually bikes or walks. And the other day, I saw him riding one of those green. I think it's Lime is the one out here. Wow. Scooters oh, home. Yeah. And I was like, "Where did? What are you doing? Like, where did you even get that?" He goes, "Oh, it's just sitting in front of the school." So I grabbed it. I was like, "Oh my god." That's just a whole different world. But what are you talking about? You're talking about one technology creating another, right? Yeah. So you have the instrument of electric batteries in cars, and now the batteries get more powerful. You can put them in a in a scooter, and those darn things are pretty fast, and the battery life's pretty good, and it's only going to accelerate. Well, this is – I could keep asking you questions. In the essence of time, just before we go, where can people go to learn more, connect with you? I don't know. Maybe buy a Honda. Well, uh, ParagonHonda.com or BrianBensock.com. You, uh, BrianBensock.com is more about me and Paragon Honda is about the store or Paragon Acura. Our, our stores are located just outside of a little city called New York City. <laughs> just a little city. <laughs> hey, can I give you a quick disruption? Uh, yeah. that's going on in New York City, uh, great population. Uh, you know, It's a wealthy city. We saw an Acura dealership go out of business, a Honda dealership go out of business. We saw uh, a Nissan dealership go out of business. We saw a Range Rover dealership go out of business. It's not because it can't afford the car. It's because it just does, doesn't make sense. doesn't make sense, yeah. No, I lived in the city for six years. It, it does not make sense to own a car. And in those days, there was really no way to do it. So I would just go to the Hertz down the street and rent right, my car right. when I wanted to go anywhere. It was still cheaper not, than having a car. Now you rent it per ride. That's right. I know. It's crazy. I wish I thought of that. All right. So this has been fantastic. What's one piece of advice you have for leaders out there looking to shake up their industries and do what you've done? Look outside of your business for the answers. The people inside the business suffer from similar people from similar backgrounds with similar thoughts, working on similar problems, and they come up with nothing. It's tantamount to putting lipstick on a pig. You need to think like a disruptor. Who invented who invented Instagram? Wasn't anybody at Kodak. <laughs> couple guys on the West Coast. You know, it's, you know, mentioning Kodak, I have to say, I mean, what's fascinating to me about that, right, is they were, to your point, they created digital photography. They're the icon. They were the icons of the business. But if you look at a lot of those big players that crumbled, um, like Blockbuster and Sears, too, they they paved the way at one point, and then they stopped innovating. So Sears really, they started home shopping. 
you not on the shopping it, channel. You better believe it. Sears was Amazon before Amazon I was know. born. Sears had a million square foot warehouse centrally located in Chicago, middle of the country, shipping stuff. You could buy a house from Sears. Yeah. And, have, yeah. and what happened? You know, yeah. it, 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 they, they went away. Well, and they rested on their success, right? They doubled down on what they what they knew versus adapting. When they asked Blockbuster, the guys at Blockbuster, and they, and they could buy Netflix for, for pennies, they said, no, 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 no. People like coming to our Blockbuster to rent videos. It's become a cultural event. Yeah. Bull- uh-huh. How long <laughs> Day. I used to go there with a baseball cap pulled down over my head in sweats, praying I didn't run into somebody. I right, know. and so you, always, I always looked my worst, and they never had the movie I wanted. Somebody always got the last copy right before I got there. You bring an empty box to a, a, a clerk to go to the back room to find it if it's there. I mean, it's ridiculous. I know, I know. Well, right, this has been fantastic. Thank you for the insights. This is great. Thank you so much. Wasn't that incredible? I know, right? Who thinks of an auto dealership owner being someone who's going to be super innovative? And I just, I really appreciate that our conversation wasn't just about the dealership, but just about innovation and change and consumer expectations and just where we're headed as a society, how we behave, how we act, how we shop. There's so much goodness in this interview. You'll probably want to listen to it twice. I know I did. But before you do that, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do what Brian did. I want you to drive innovation and be willing to push those boundaries. And that starts with having an innovation toolkit at your fingertips so that you're not pushing water uphill, so that you're actually creating momentum and ideas and collaboration, and most importantly, action. So what I want you to do is go to our website, go to launchtreat.com, G-O-T-O, launchtreat.com, and I want you to click on the IQE Pro Toolkit. That's right. It's a toolkit, which means it has two important things in it. Number one, it has the Innovation Quotient Edge assessment so that you can discover your unique style of innovation, how you innovate so that you can contribute to the world in that way. And second, it has all the tools you need to put innovation into action daily. We'll put the link in the show notes. Tamara out. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, launchstreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.